Hi, it's Dave. Welcome. Today, I'm joined by Roger Veer. He is an early Bitcoin advocate. He actually got into Bitcoin when it was under a dollar, supposedly. Um, he earned the nickname Bitcoin Jesus early on with his passion to really um, advocate for crypto. He's been an early investor in first generation crypto companies like Ripple, BitPay, Kraken, Zcash, Blockchain, Bitcoin.com, uh, Blockchain.com. And um, yeah, I'm excited to have Roger on the show. Welcome, Roger. How are you doing? Great, Dave. Uh, thanks for the invite. Awesome. Yeah. So, Raj, I want to focus today on how you developed this conviction so early on with Bitcoin and crypto and kind of dissect that. So hopefully, you know, maybe some of us can catch some of your key insights. And I want to also dive into how you're viewing crypto back then, but also now and how it's evolved to try to get a bigger picture. But before that, I want to ask your opinion on the current crypto kind of price cycle. Um, do you track kind of crypto prices day to day? And do you have a view on what's going on? Do you think we're in the middle of a, a bull run that's going to continue to 2022? Or do you think, do you see things more shaky? Or, and do you have any framework that you use to kind of evaluate prices? In the short term, the prices will either go up or go down or stay the same. Nobody knows. In the long term, the blockchains and the and the coins and the tokens that are the actual that are actually useful for people to engage in some sort of economic activity, those are the ones that are going to be valuable in the long term. So if it's just speculators speculating on the future speculation of future speculators, that's not a game I'm interested in playing at all. Mm -hmm. But if it's building fundamental utility of things that people are actually going to be able to use in their day to day lives, whether it's some form of peer to peer electronic cash or or you know harnessing the wisdom of crowds or or there's you know all sorts of interesting things, things that can be done. If it's people trying to actually build some useful tool, then I'm much more interested than just you know price speculation because oh, this coin has a cute dog face. Like that's that's not nearly as exciting as, as much as we all love Dogecoin. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, how do you judge or um, assess utility? Is it actual usage, like whether people are using it, um, or is it something a little bit different? I, there can be a lot of different things. So like utility just means useful, but useful for what, right? A shovel is useful for digging holes, but an airplane is useful for flying around in the sky. But there's not much overlap between a shovel and a, an a airplane as to what they're actually used for. And the same can be true with different tokens on different blockchains. Uh, some of them can be used for completely different things than, than others. The one that caught my attention first and got me the most excited the earliest on was the peer-to-peer the -peer electronic cash use case. As someone who had been involved in e-commerce since the very beginning of e-commerce, when people were still doing payments by buying postal money orders and sending them in the mail to pay for their e-commerce orders, uh, Bitcoin solved a huge, huge, huge problem early on for, for people engaged in e-commerce. And so that got me excited about that. But now there's all sorts of other exciting projects on the blockchains that aren't revolving around e-commerce or payments or, or the cash aspect. And I'm sure some of those are going to be very, very popular uh, as well. Uh, Ethereum is... is the most notable uh, example of that, but there's a whole bunch of other ones out there as well. Yeah. Um, what other projects? I know you are a bit, big Bitcoin Cash proponent. You just mentioned Ethereum. What are the let's say other you know three or four kind of top projects or you know blockchains that you are kind of following the most? Yeah, I, I wish there were more hours in the day to follow them all now because there's literally thousands of them. Um, but the, the projects I follow the most are, are definitely uh, Bitcoin Cash, Ethereum. Um, Monero has been interesting to me for a long time as well. Uh, I'm the most excited by the peer to peer electronic cash aspect. Mm -hmm. And so whatever coins are the most useful for people to have, you know, peer to peer electronic cash, those are the ones that I'm the most interested in because those are the ones that I think have the biggest impact on improving the, the rate of economic growth for the entire world. And if we increase the rate of economic growth for the whole world, we're all living in a, a richer, wealthier, happier, you know, place with more exciting things. I mm. just look at all the stuff uh, Elon Musk has managed to do with his uh, capital that he's accumulated over the years. It's just uh, not only has it made his life better, but it's made all of our lives better. And so the more stuff we have like that going on in the world, the better the world is. And I think the best tool we have to enable that is is digital currencies that actually function as cash for for the whole planet, not just for for you know, speculators to speculate. Mm -hmm. Got it. Um, yeah, I want to talk about kind of that distinction between peer-to-peer -peer cash versus store of value, but let's push that off for a bit. Um, I want to dive into the genesis of your kind of Bitcoin interest because you were one of the first to not just had conviction. Obviously, lots of people were interested, but you had more than conviction. You had the passion to evangelize, in a sense, um, Bitcoin very 
um, passionately early on when it was kind of, I guess, so nascent and um, still something that people were just trying to figure out. So let's go back, back in the day, before even you discover Bitcoin, what do you think were the key factors that allowed you to discover Bitcoin, to understand it and to see its potential when you did see it eventually? Yeah, to, to be honest, I, I feel like I discovered Bitcoin in 1997 or 98 or somewhere in the late 90s. Um, and I discovered it. I learned about it. I didn't discover it. I learned about it from somebody else. And the somebody else that I learned about it from <clears throat> was probably most, I, there wasn't one single person, but the biggest person I learned the most about it from uh, was a man named uh, David Friedman, who's this uh, son of Milton Friedman, the Nobel Prize winning economist. And David Friedman wrote a really interesting book in the late 90s called uh, Future Imperfect. And in this book, he talks all about digital signatures and explains exactly how they work, which is a huge part of the technology that you know, underlies all these blockchains. And then he also talked about how the, you know, the internet was just getting started in the late 90s and, and it was all still brand new and people were speculating, or what, what are people actually gonna use it for? And in, in his book, he described about how using digital signatures so you can prove you're dealing with the same person time and time again, and you can have a reputation feedback uh, system using these digital signatures. He basically described the Silk Road, but instead of the Silk Road being for drugs in his example, the Silk Road in his example was gonna be used for uh, an unlicensed lawyer to practice law and give legal advice over the internet um, without getting caught. And all you needed was this uh, anonymous site, I think he called it cyber cash in the book. And uh, for people that don't know David Friedman, uh, teaches law or used to teach law at Santa Clara University, but was a physicist by, uh, by actual training. So he didn't, he never, I don't think passed the bar, um, but just a really, really interesting guy. And I thought, oh, what a really interesting thing, because there were all sorts of barriers to, to doing commerce on the internet that I didn't think really needed to be there. And if the, if peer to peer electronic cash, or as he put it, cyber cash existed, untraceable anonymous cyber cash for the internet existed, then a huge number of these barriers would be torn down, which would allow a huge number of people to provide the goods and services that other people want to buy in, in the free market there. And I thought that, that was a, a really, really exciting, wonderful development uh, for the world. And uh, was really excited about it, but then nothing happened. Mm -hmm. uh, and another you know, decade plus went by until finally, uh, finally I heard about Bitcoin. It was like, oh, the cyber cash I had read about in these books in the late 90s, it's finally arrived and now it's called Bitcoin. And, and I knew without any doubt whatsoever that people were going to start using it uh, as money. So I knew it from these economics books that I had studied uh, from a child, uh, from my, my youth. But uh, I also knew, and I imagine you plan to touch on this at some point, but I spent mm -hmm. some time in federal prison in the United States. Mm -hmm. And inside federal prison, I got to see that there's and one of the things that makes humans humans is trading with other human beings, right? That's why we have everything we have. Is why we have, you know, the shirt I'm wearing, the computer I'm talking to you on, the food I have, you know, to eat. It's because we all trade with each other. And so one of the very first rules when you get to prison is that you're not allowed to trade anything with anybody. But trading with other human beings, that's what makes humans humans. And that's why we've been able to accomplish, you know, everything that we have in the world. And so, of course, everybody's busy trading with everybody else in prison. And so, yeah, there's some barter stuff like, you know, you do this for me and I'll do that for you. But a medium of exchange is incredibly important to facilitate trade when people don't have the same thing that uh, overlaps that one guy has and the other guy wants uh, in both directions. So people just naturally in prison started to use postage stamps, top ramen soups and tobacco as money. And if you think about it, all of those things have additional use cases as well. Um, but they all have certain characteristics that made them incredibly useful as money. They were very easy to store. They wouldn't spoil or go bad. They were easy to recognize. You can't counterfeit any of those things. And then uh, the additional use case was incredibly important there too. You can mail letters with stamps. You can smoke the tobacco. You can eat the top ramen soups. That was all very uh, important stuff for that to just naturally become used as money. And so I had the the theoretical evidence as the origin of monies from uh, money or mean, mediums of exchange from these economics books I had been studying as a young man. But then I had the practical uh, firsthand experience in the prison economy that yeah. people just naturally start to use things as money. And so then when Bitcoin came along, there was zero doubt in my mind that people were going to start using it as money. And so its biggest problem in the early days was basically that it, uh, it seemed too good to be real. And when I would tell people about it, they're like, this, this can't be real. This is too good. But, it, but I had to convince them, no, this was real and it's here and you can use it right now today. Let me, let me set you up with a wallet and I'll even send you some for free. And that's uh, what I've been doing. And, and today, that version of Bitcoin that I was so excited about 
most closely resembles Bitcoin Cash, but there's you know 5,000 other blockchains out there as well, all competing in the marketplace for uh, ideas and market share and user adoption. And uh, at the end of the day, whichever one works the best for the biggest number of people around the world is going to be the one that gets used the most. Uh, and only one of those characteristics that makes it easy to use is the pre-existing network effect. But there's still a huge, huge, huge way to, uh, to go. So I, I think if I had to pick two cryptocurrencies that I think are in the pole position for becoming the, the currency of the Internet, uh, I think it's Ethereum and Bitcoin Cash. Those are the two. But uh, both of them have some issues that they have to overcome in order to, to get that position. Got it. Um, yeah, this bartering in prison, I mean, that's fascinating because that's a whole new world, uh, alternate world of existence, living rules, system, um, economic, social structure, culture. And you saw kind of, you know, a whole, you know, different type of um, economic system trading coming in. Like, I'm curious, what did you trade for um, when you were in prison? Like, yeah, what were kind of your needs? So the, the main thing that I traded for was for additional free time. Um, I just wanted to spend my time reading books. Uh, you know, typical nerd, wanted to read as many books as I could while I was there and didn't want to spend my time. Uh, for example, initially I got assigned to have to work in the cafeteria. So I was busy, you know, cleaning the tables and cleaning the dishes and, you know, preparing, doing all the food prep stuff. Um, that wasn't how I wanted to spend my time. I would rather spend my time uh, reading books. So eventually I was able to get assigned to a better job. Um, that was my job was to just keep part of the floor clean in, in the prison. And it wouldn't take that much time, but rather than spend my time cleaning the floor there, I was able to pay another inmate, uh, I think it was only five or $10 a month uh, to take care of my job for me. And so that freed up my time completely to where I could just lay around in my bunk and just read books all day. And, uh, and then I also paid another inmate to do my laundry as well. So I didn't have to spend any time waiting around at the washing machines and and doing that mm -hmm. sort of thing as well. So uh, mm -hmm. basically, I was able to buy or trade for additional free time to be able to read books. And that was a it benefited me and it benefited the people that I paid. Otherwise, they wouldn't have accepted the other side of the offer because these people then had more money to, to buy the things they needed. A, a lot of people don't realize this mm -hmm. is that uh, in federal prison, uh, there's what's called commissary, which is basically like the, the convenience store within the prison where you can buy things like shampoo and toothpaste and mm -hmm. even some snacks like potato chips and things like that. But you're only allowed to go to the prison commissary on certain days of the week, depending on what your inmate number is. You're allowed to go, I think it was just one day a week. But let's mm -hmm. say, you know, you bought your toothpaste on Monday or something and you ran out of your deodorant on, on Thursday or, or, or whatever it is that you happen to need and you still can't go to the, the store for, you know, another couple of days there. There are other inmates within the prison and what they do is they literally run their own stores and their entire mm -hmm. prison, everything you own in the entire world in prison is in a little tiny uh, you know, half size high school type locker, all your clothes, all your toothpaste, all your everything. But what certain inmates would do is they would allocate all the space in their locker for all of the goods that are sold at the prison commissary. And then other inmates could basically go to the convenience store run by another inmate at any time and buy whatever it is that they needed from that other inmate. And they would pay them with either top ramen soups, postage stamps or tobacco. If they didn't have the money right there, there is even a whole credit network within the prison where people would extend credit to people that needed things that they uh, you know, needed right then and there. And if they didn't pay back in time, there was definitely an enforcement mechanism to collect upon those debts as well. And it was really interesting to see just how all of that worked naturally without some you know, hierarchical system imposing it down upon everybody, that people just naturally, spontaneously organized these systems that worked pretty darn well. If you wanted you know, pretty much anything at any time of day or night that was available uh, within the prison, you could get it, and uh, including illegal drugs. That's just uh, to touch on another point. Even in federal prison, you could get illegal drugs. If you had enough money, you could get, of course, marijuana, but you could get harder drugs like heroin and cocaine and other things too. So if they couldn't keep illegal drugs out of federal prison, it's just absolutely ridiculous to think that they can keep it out of the whole country. And uh, that's what we saw in the early days with the Silk Road. Uh, mm -hmm. People started using Bitcoin to buy illegal drugs more than anything else. Uh, and to me, you know, I've never used any sort of drugs ever. I've never even smoked a cigarette. Um, but it just seems so incredibly fascinating and interesting to me that people all over the world were just naturally coming together to be able to engage and trade for things that is effectively make people feel happy. Um, and it was kind of beyond the reach of the, the state to do that. And everybody knows that the, the Silk Road was eventually shut down and the owner was arrested and sentenced to die in prison. He was like, a, I think, a 20-something-year-old man when he got arrested. There's a guy named Free, uh, Ross Ulbricht. He's now uh, sentenced to die in prison. But there's now more darknet markets, 
selling more drugs using cryptocurrency than ever before. Like it, it, not only did they not shut it down, it's more popular than it's ever been. And it's only going to continue to get more and more popular, which is a, a sign of how desirable cryptocurrencies are for actual use in e-commerce, whether it's regular, you know, above board white e-commerce uh, or if it's, you know, dark net market stuff where people are buying and selling illegal products. But uh, mm -hmm. it's it's not going away at all. It just shows. Uh, and I, I think one example, though, that shows how you can choose which cryptocurrencies are useful in the dark net markets at this point, there's two main cryptocurrencies that are being used. One is Bitcoin because it was the incumbent and it was there from the earliest days. But the other one that is is pretty much the taken over at this point for that is Monero because the privacy is so incredibly strong on Monero. And so if people naturally, despite Bitcoin's network effect, have switched to using Monero, that's a very, very strong case for Monero's usefulness as money uh, in e-commerce. Because one of the things that makes money money is fungibility. And the fungibility on Bitcoin is is absolutely atrocious, whereas mm -hmm. the fungibility on uh, things like Monero is much, much better. And uh, But we'll see how governments react to that because it's uh, it's a coin that's much, much harder for them to, to spy on and, and see what people are up to with their funds. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm curious. In prison, did you have how did you have, how did, how did you have access to money? Was it just cash, or did you bring it in, or did you actually were you able to somehow you know get cash from outside? Yeah, I, there was a little bit of physical cash floating around in the prison, but that was also contraband. So like mm -hmm. uh, most most of the time, people didn't use cash. But the way it works is you could have somebody outside of the prison send money <clears throat> onto your, what they call it, put money on your books. And what that basically means is they would credit your account within the prison with regular old dollars. So they'd have to send like a, a postal money order or whatever. Uh, and nowadays you can probably use credit cards or heck, maybe you can even use cryptocurrency to fund someone's uh, prison account nowadays. But mm -hmm. uh, then once you have the money on your account, you have uh, your prison ID card. I don't have it uh, handy with me at the moment, thankfully. But uh, you use that almost like a credit card. There were machines that could scan your prison ID card and it would debit the funds from your prison account and you could buy whatever you needed from the commissary. And so to pay other people for, you know, for example, doing my job within the prison, uh, they would tell me what they would want from the commissary. And when my next day for commissary would come, I would buy whatever it is that they put on the list and, and give that to them. And right. so that was the way uh, the payments would work uh, within the prison there. Got it. Were you able to, I guess, fund your, your um, account through people outside or that you would ask to fund or how did you initially get it funded? Yeah, so I was lucky enough that I, I had some assets before I went to prison. Yeah. And so I, I just asked a family member, hey, uh, got it. And actually, I think I had some money in my wallet. I think they recommended bring some cash when you actually, because I got mm. to choose the day I started my prison sentence. So when I showed up, I think I had some cash in my wallet. Got and it. they, I think they credited it directly to, to my prison account there. But it's, it's this has been 20 years, so I don't yeah. remember quite as clearly any longer. Yeah. Um, yeah, fascinating stuff. Um, was prison violent, the prison that you went to? I don't it, it can be. So I was at a medium security facility and, mm -hmm. you know, you try and mind your own business and don't start drama where there shouldn't be drama. But uh, you know, I definitely saw some some fights and saw some uh, and probably the worst. The worst thing that I saw happen probably while I was there is uh, whether you're racist or not, it doesn't matter in prison. You're part of your race inside the prison. Mm -hmm. And so where I was there, the main races there were, you know, there's white, black. And then there's Mexicans from the U.S. and there's Mexicans from Mexico. Those are two separate races within the prison I was at. Uh, Asians, like all Asians, are one race. So it doesn't matter if you're Filipino, Chinese, Japanese, Korean. You're one singular race uh, in prison. And then, uh, interestingly enough, another effectively race in prison uh, was homosexual. And it didn't matter if you're a white homosexual or a black homosexual or Asian homosexual. All the homosexuals are also their own race, uh, which I thought was strange and interesting at the same time but uh at one point uh, there's like a tv section in the prison and uh the v a couple of uh, vietnamese guys were watching the vietnamese channel or something like that and then the mexican guy showed up and wanted to put on telemundo and rather than waiting their turn or what you know i i, I never watched tv while i was in prison so i don't know exactly what the etiquette is supposed to be or how that's supposed to work but rather than negotiating it in, a, in what I think would be a more appropriate way, the Mexicans effectively strong-armed the Vietnamese into putting on Telemundo. And there were more Mexicans than Vietnamese at, at that moment. Um, and so the Vietnamese just just left and they didn't start any sort of a fight right then and there or, or anything. And the Mexicans got to watch their Telemundo. 
And then I think it was that same night, or maybe it was the one night later, um, in the middle of the night. So the way it works is the, this was at FCI Lompoc, which used to be a big giant uh, uh, Air Force base. Mm-hmm. And there's big giant, uh, what used to be the Air Force barracks, military barracks, like big giant long, basically a warehouse with concrete walls, concrete floors, concrete ceiling. And they just have rows and rows of bunk beds in there. So you have a couple of hundred guys in like a big giant room. Mm-hmm. And so one of these guys snuck up on one of the Mexican guys in the middle of the night while he was uh, asleep. And he had made a, a stabbing instrument out of, uh, he disassembled part of his locker. And there's like the the locking pins that go to close the locker. He had taken one of those apart and sharpened one up and uh, really oh, stabbed man. the guy up uh, really, really badly while the guy was uh, sleeping over the, having changed the TV channel uh, earlier in the day. And I, I don't think that guy survived. And that was a, that was a pretty big uh, mess. Um, so there's, there's some things like that. Um, but for the most part, I just stayed, uh, in my bunk reading, reading books, uh, most of the time. So, and that was, uh, I think a pretty, pretty good way to pass my time and, uh, was never about to pressure anybody to change the TV channel if they didn't want to change the TV channel. I'll tell you that much. So, although were fun, you, um, were you, um, constantly in fear or did you just kind of learn how to cope and just kind of navigate and just stay away from, you know, anything that you thought was potentially dangerous? I, I, there were a couple of times where I was uh, afraid, but the, I, it wasn't constant fear for me. It was more constant frustration with the situation that I was in uh, in life, because I, I don't think that I did anything wrong. And yet there I was uh, in federal prison uh, and kind of had my entire life turned uh, upside down for that. One, uh, I guess, a funny side story there, too, because... Mm-hmm. Everybody knew I just stayed in my bunk all day reading books. That's all I did. I was just, you know, had my nose in the book all the time. And so my, and I was real young. I was like a 22 year old kid and only weighed, I don't know, maybe 130 pounds or something when I went in and lost a bunch of weight when I went into prison. All my friends, most people go to prison and bulk up and become stronger. I, I lost a bunch of weight in prison because the food was so bad. I didn't even want to touch it, let alone uh, have to eat it. But my nickname in the prison became uh, El Peligroso. And for those that don't speak Spanish, that means the dangerous one. And that was just a joke because I'm this little tiny skinny kid that just lays in bed reading books all day. So uh, it kind of became the the joke. Yeah. That was my uh, my nickname in, in prison there. That's funny. Um, maybe it was actually, it, it rang true to some of those folks there just because the people who are the most kind of voracious in knowledge and books, you know, they end up doing, you know, some stuff, um, some crazy stuff or yeah. impactful you could stuff argue potentially that- in the future. We could argue that cryptocurrency has uh, definitely been the dangerous to the to the <laughs> exactly. control of the state in the world, so, which is certainly exactly. what attracted me to it so much. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I'm wondering. Um, yeah, uh, I'm curious to hear what what got you in prison because I I know you know the story is you were um, you sold some fireworks on eBay, shipped them to people, but you didn't even sell that much. You weren't like a huge dealer. And I'm not sure why that would get you 10 months in federal prison. So yeah, what's, I don't understand, like what's, what's behind, you know, like your imprisonment story? Yeah. So for, for those that, that don't know that story, um, the, there's, I, I put longer form discussions of that on my own mm-hmm. YouTube channel. People can search that out if they're interested in the full details. But, uh, basically, um, like most young men, and I guess, uh, didn't plan this this way at all, but, uh, sitting behind the table here. I have some additional firecrackers. I have some nice bottle rockets here, which are perfectly legal in St. Kitts. Uh, no yeah. problem at all. But uh, I still like fireworks, I guess, to this day. And I'm in a residential apartment building as well. But uh, I'd uh, been selling, this is in the early days of uh, eBay, uh, a product called a Pest Control Report 2000, which was basically a firecracker that uh, supposedly and effectively was legal in all 50 states. Uh, but you're technically supposed to use it to to, for agricultural use, basically to scare birds away. It would make a noise and it would scare, you know, birds out of your cornfield or whatever, you, you know, farm farmers are doing. Um, but for any young man, oh, this works just like a firecracker. Great. And you could buy them from Cabela's Sporting Goods Catalog, which is the biggest sporting goods catalog in the U.S. to this day, and from a, a whole bunch of other, uh, you know, catalogs and that sort of thing. Uh, and so I bought them just for me because they were fun. And my parents had a ranch and we would go set them off on the ranch and whatnot. Um and then I noticed that uh, they could sell for even more on eBay because other people were all, already selling them on eBay. So I bought more of this product and then started to reselling them on eBay. It was just a little tiny side business where I made a little bit of extra money um, selling some of those. And it was just something fun, um, which would have been fine and dandy and no problem whatsoever 
had I not mixed that with also running for a political office in the United States. I ran for California State Assembly as a libertarian. So I had been reading all these economics books. Mm -hmm. And you look at, you know, the, the more government interferes in the economy, the slower the rate of economic growth becomes and the, the lower everyone's standard of living becomes compared to what it otherwise would have been. And so I figured, oh, people need to know about these sorts of things. So like, uh, you know, here's a good way to to help spread the word. And so I got involved in the Libertarian Party in Silicon Valley and ran for political office. And this was, again, this is in uh, the year 2000 was the election. So not too many years after there has been a, effectively a, a massacre in Waco, Texas, right? So like the parents of this religious cult were, you know, religious nuts, but there were dozens of kids like, you know, less than 10 years old over there. And the FBI and ATF uh, effectively burnt them all to death inside their, their church uh, place there. And so, like, even if the parents are religious nuts, burning to death a bunch of kids is not okay. And so, like, if I saw a bank robber and trying to catch the bank robber, I shot up a whole bunch of other people and killed a bunch of innocent people, I would go to jail for a long, long time. That's exactly what the ATF and FBI did. Like, even if the parents were guilty of all sorts of crimes, murdering a bunch of kids is still murder and uh, shouldn't uh, shouldn't go unpunished. Yet, that's exactly what happened. So, in the debates, I was calling the FBI and ATF a bunch of uh, jackbooted thugs and murderers in reference to all the children, some of which were like, you know, two, three, four years old kids, they literally murdered. And uh, boy, did they not like this, uh, you know, 20 year old ma young man already fairly successful in business, calling them a bunch of murderers and saying that there shouldn't even be an FBI or ATF or, or uh, these agencies and that they do more harm than good in the world. And uh, so I wound up becoming uh, the target of an investigation as to what they could prosecute me for. And I wound up being the only person in the entire country uh, in, to this very day to have ever been prosecuted for selling this pest control report 2000. And so I eventually signed a plea deal um, because they told me if I didn't sign the plea deal, they'd give me seven or eight years in prison. Uh -huh. So I signed a plea deal for uh, the plea deal was, I think, uh, eight to 14 months was the range. They gave me 10 months eventually. And even while I was in federal prison, Cabela's Sporting Goods Catalog, the manufacturer, all these other resellers were still selling the exact same product with no license. And so uh, it really, the first few months I was in prison, I was just really mad because I was still, I'm still mad, but I'd, I was still, you know, reading economics books and just studying all this stuff. And it just like made me really, really frustrated. And here I was trying to make the world a better place and, and spreading knowledge because that's the, the tool that humans have to make the world a better place. We learn and then we apply that knowledge mm -hmm. to improving our, our surroundings and the world we live in. And so the more pe the more knowledge people have access to, the better the entire world can become for everybody. And I got tossed in jail for trying to help spread important knowledge that can help make the world a better place. And so I was uh, feeling really, really frustrated and depressed while still reading these, you know, economics books uh, in prison. So then I switched to studying Japanese, and it came out with a, a pretty useful uh, skill. And that uh, by the time I got out, I could. Uh, uh, read and write some Japanese and speak some, although listening is a completely separate skill from speaking, which is what I learned. Now, now I can do both, but uh, or all of them. But uh, but I, I used the second half of my time in prison to do that. But uh, yeah, that's a yeah. uh, long story short. If you can do whatever you want, for, for the most part, as long as you're not hurting somebody and not making comments politically. The moment you start making comments politically, uh, watch out, they're going to come for you. And everybody knows that that's true in, in like mainland China. But it's also true in the U.S. and lots of other countries as well. And just look at what they're doing to Julian Assange and Edward Snowden and Bradley Manning and uh, all these people. The moment you speak out about uh, anything the government's doing that's wrong, they're going to come after you with a, a vengeance. And uh, I love what Elon Musk has been saying recently. But uh, and he's you know the richest guy in the world. But uh, you better watch out. These people can be really evil and really vindictive. And uh, but uh, I'm I'm cheering for Elon. Uh, yeah. I've, I've really been enjoying some of the comments in the back and forth he's had with uh, Senator uh, Warren and some of these other people here. So. Yeah. Um, it's dangerous. I mean, he's playing with fire without any doubt. So. Yeah. Um, I mean, like, who is, I mean, is it, like, okay, for Elon Musk, is is the risk, do you think, is it something coordinating in the background or is it just like a couple of bad actors who want to retaliate and then just try to, you know, work the system to get some type of, you know, something against him going. It, it, it only takes one motivated prosecutor looking to make a name for himself, you know, somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, it usually seems to wind up being the Southern District of New York, but it, it can be mm -hmm. anyone anywhere. And when they, I look at how many things Elon has his fingers in and how many businesses he's involved in there, like if they want him, they can get him without uh, any doubt. And yeah, he can, he can slow things down and gum things up with a bunch of lawyers, but when they want you, they're coming for you. And, uh, 
Mm. But uh, I'm clearly Elon's the good guy in this. And uh, I, I see you know, he's paid, what, $11 billion in, uh, in taxes for the earth? Mm -hmm. Think about it. Who would you rather have that money? Elon, what amazing new inventions would he be able to do with that money invested in some sort of new business versus what's the government going to do with it? Maybe they'll burn to death some more kids in a church somewhere else or build some drones to drop bombs on kids in a foreign country. Like That's now not how I would like to see the $11 billion spent. I would like to watch and see what Elon decides to do with it. And who knows? You know, We already have all this amazing stuff from him. Maybe there'd be another uh, amazing something that would come from it. But uh, I'm sure that we're not going to see something... Uh, even half as amazing come out of the the way the government's going to spend that 11 billion, which they've already spent, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, Sorry for the rant. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no problem. <laughs> um, it seems like the your prison experience. I mean, when I, when I just look at it as an outsider, I'm like, wow, that's like that's crazy. It's a formative time in your life. You're like 22 years old, and you're convinced that this is retaliation. It has nothing to do with the actual so-called crime because people are still doing it without any you know there's nothing you're the only person right being um uh punished for it does this how does it shape your view of the government at this time and and connecting it to bitcoin does that help you recognize kind of the power and potential of bitcoin when it when you do see it so yes yes and yes i guess there it uh, uh. So a lot of people always, they tell me, oh, I'm so sorry you went to prison and you had to go mm -hmm. through that. And and there's this great uh, proverb of the, the Chinese farmer. And I don't know if you're familiar with that yet, but uh, basically there's a Chinese farmer and uh, he has a horse on his farm there and the, his horse runs away. And, you know, a horse is important to the farm and the neighbors say, oh, uh, that's, that's too bad that your horse ran away. And the Chinese farmer goes, maybe. And then the next day, the horse that had run away, it, it runs back, but it brought three wild horses with it. And like the, all the neighbors, you know, come out and say, oh, that's great, because now he's going to have, you know, three additional horses there. And the Chinese farmer goes, maybe. And then the next day, his, the Chinese farmer's son is trying to tame the wild horses and gets kicked off one of the wild horses and breaks his leg when he falls off. And all the neighbors come and say, oh, that's too bad, isn't it? And the Chinese farmer goes, Maybe. And then the next day, the military draft board shows up to the town looking for young men to draft into the military. But the Chinese farmer's son's leg is broken, so they can't draft him into the military. And all the neighbors say, well, that's great, isn't it? And the Chinese farmer again goes, maybe. And the point of that is, at the time, something can seem really fantastic or really bad, but in the bigger picture, you don't really know. And so I'll tell you, like at the time, going to prison seemed really, really bad. But I wouldn't be the person that I am today, and I certainly wouldn't have had the same sort of excitement for Bitcoin as early on as I did if I hadn't gone through that. And so was it a was it a bad experience at the time? Yes. Was it a bad experience from the overall picture of my life? Maybe not. Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, but it absolutely played a big, big, big role. And uh, it kind of. I guess I had been what's called a, a minarchist up to that point, which is somebody that thinks like, oh, the government can be in charge of, you know, roads, police, and the court system, and and that'll be okay. And then uh, it kind of uh, pushed me over the edge to just being a full-on anarchist. I think the world would get on just fine if we didn't have a centralized monopoly on the use of force and, and violence in, in society. I think the world would continue on just fine with it without that. And uh, the more I've studied it and the more I've aged, the, the more I'm convinced of that. Um, yeah. But uh, Bitcoin was uh, one of the main things that uh, regular currencies is one of the main things that governments use to control people all over the planet. The invention of Bitcoin was the tool that liberated people all over the planet to no longer have to be under the control of governments uh, telling them what they can or can't do with their own money. So that's what uh, attracted it uh, attracted me to it so early on and, and yeah. inspired me to buy up a bunch of it and then start building in and investing in the, the tools to make it useful as cash for people mm -hmm. all over the world. And that's why the, the cash use case is still the most exciting uh, use case of digital currencies uh, or, or blockchains in general for me. Uh, that peer-to-peer -peer electronic, mm -hmm. uncensorable, unstoppable, anonymous cash for the world is uh, what still has me so excited to this very day. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it's, it would seem like, you know, you have these, you know, libertarian ideals even before going to prison enough to run for office in the state. So you are convicted, yet you go through this unjust retaliation and you see a whole different part of the world. You see it kind of this, you know, um, we'll call it the, the dark kind of <laughs> government justice side where it's not just, you know, there is much subjectivity and manipulation in the system that most people aren't even 
you know, aware of. And you see this not just as a distant standby uh, observer, but as a, it is impacting your life in deep ways. And I could just imagine like how deeply this becomes, you know, it affects, profoundly affects, you know, you and your, your view of yourself, the world, the government, et cetera. And by the time Bitcoin, when you find Bitcoin, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but I would love to get corrected. Like it just would seem like you would just feel it in your bones, like how important this is, you know? Um, yeah. What are your thoughts? Yeah. And that's exactly how it was. Once, once I put together the pieces in my head of how Bitcoin worked and how it was uncensorable, unstoppable cash for the entire world, uh, I literally got so excited about it that uh, I couldn't sleep. And I'm someone who likes to get you know my full at least seven hours uh, of sleep uh, each night. And uh, I found out about it uh, you know while I was having breakfast one morning. Uh, and then I didn't. I was planning to go to the office that day. I didn't go to the office. I stayed home reading about Bitcoin all day. I stayed up all night reading it. It's the only time in my entire life I've ever stayed up like all night like that. I stayed up all night reading more about it into the next day. Stayed up until like maybe 4 p.m. the next afternoon reading about it. Fell asleep just for maybe two hours. Woke up again, started reading about it some more and stayed up all night again the next night until like maybe 10 a.m. the next morning. And then fell asleep for maybe only again, you know, two two hours. And I did this for about a whole week straight, only sleeping, you know, an hour and a half, two hours a night. And then after doing that for about a week, just I, I literally didn't leave the house for a week and just microwaved some food and kept reading about Bitcoin. And uh, uh, I got really, really, really sick to the point where I literally had to call one of my good friends and say, help me. I'm so sick. I need you to take me to the hospital. Mm -hmm. And uh, and he was nice enough. He came and drove over to my house and then took me to the hospital and they gave me some sort of a sedative and they said, you need to rest and calm down. And I think I, I slept, I don't know, maybe 16 hours straight or something like that at that point. But then when I woke up again, it was all Bitcoin and it all, you know, peer to peer electronic cash uh, ever since. Uh, and here we are uh, uh, almost 11 years later now. So yeah. time, time has flown. Yeah, I mean, that totally makes sense in a sense because for me, I would like just hearing your situation, your background, I would imagine like Bitcoin just, it, you, you see immediately the political ramifications, the economic ramifications, the social ramifications, just the historic ramifications. You understand this in the flow of technology is something that's not just evolutionary, it's radically different. It has potential to create new structures and new f forms of just... You know, and undermine existing structures that I don't think should exist. Exactly. And, and so that's, up to uh, that point, I felt I had been really mistreated by the you know mm -hmm. federal justice system, but I had zero recourse. What could I possibly do about it? I, I could tweet about it or make a YouTube video about it and complain a little bit, but that doesn't really change anything and is more likely to get you uh, tossed in jail again. Yet when Bitcoin came along, suddenly I had some recourse and a way to, to seek some justice in the, in the yeah. way that uh, not just myself, but millions and millions of others have been mistreated as well. And in the prison I was in, I would say 75, 80 percent of the people there were there for victimless crimes, mostly buying, selling or, or using drugs. Mm -hmm. uh, and what a, what a horrible, horrible world in which you know millions of people are having their lives destroyed not because they've done anything bad, but just because they've been, you know, buying, selling, or using a, a plant or a powder that makes people feel happy. Uh, that's, mm -hmm. that's something that I think needs to stop. I think people own themselves and should be able to decide what they do or don't put in their own body. And uh, they should be able to buy or sell anything that's peaceful. And uh, it's the lawyers, the judges, the prosecutors, and, and you know, prison guards that are uh, putting people in jail for doing those things. Those are the bad people that need to stop, not the, not the inmates. And uh, I see Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies as a, as a tool to move the world in that direction. And that's what got me so yeah. excited about it to the point where I, I couldn't sleep. I was so, so excited about it. Yeah. Um, when did you connect um, the government's control of money and the money system to kind of, you know, the government's ability to control people slash, you know, I don't know, have excess power. When did that kind of link and connection, you know, uh, hit you? I, I don't think I can say that there is a specific date other than that, like money is one half of just about every transaction. Like anytime you're buying or selling anything, whether it's a, a bottle of water or the microphone I'm using to talk to you uh, with or, or anything, it's, it's money. And almost all the payments, especially nowadays, are made through online banking or credit cards or some sort of digital, like all payments are digital already, right? Even before, you know, Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies, 
PayPal is a digital currency. The U.S. dollar is is almost always a di in digital form. Like very rarely do people pay with the pieces of paper money any longer. It's all digital, and the government controls and tracks and watches and restricts anything and everything that uh, people do with that. Uh, and so that's been the case for pretty much my entire uh, adult life, uh, or even as, as a child. Like most payments still were were starting to be you know online stuff. So the moment you can have people have money that they're in charge of themselves you strip away a huge, huge, huge amount of government's ability to control what people are up to. Uh, and I'm looking forward to seeing more e-commerce being doable uh, beyond the purview of the state, because anytime anybody trades anything with anybody uh, voluntarily, both people are richer after the trade, right? If you buy a Starbucks coffee for you know five bucks or 10 bucks or whatever they cost now, it's because you value the coffee more than you value the money that you give Starbucks. And Starbucks values the money more than they value the coffee. So both you and Starbucks are wealthier after the trade happens. When you buy a new iPhone, same story, computer, anything else. Uh, the only time uh, that people engage in trade that's not voluntary, people aren't better off, right? And so the only time that people aren't dealing with each other on a voluntary basis are, are you know, murderers, rapists, robbers. And because after you've been robbed, you don't feel better off. Otherwise, that trade wouldn't have happened, right? Um, but governments, that's the one exception, right? So everyone knows that murderers, rapists, robbers are the bad people because they're dealing on other people on an involuntary basis. Government's the one big giant exception that I think everyone's been brainwashed from a very young age into thinking that, oh, it's okay when government deals with people on an involuntary basis because it's the government, of course. That's how it's always been. But if you stop and take a step back and think about it, why should government get a free pass to do the exact same things that robbers do, right? If a robber comes to your house and steals your stuff and says, oh, don't worry, I'm going to use part of it to pave the road down the street so it doesn't count as robbery. You'd, you'd think the guy's a crazy person. Mm -hmm. But when governments do the same thing, people get to, they give them a free pass. But uh, I, I hope more and more people will stop and, and step back and think, oh, in this world of the amazing internet where everybody can communicate with everybody else, we can probably figure out a way to build roads without you know, threatening peaceful people with violence and figure out a way to build hospitals and bridges and schools without threatening peaceful people with violence. I'm, I'm sure we can figure out how to do that. And so... Uh, I think the governments are kind of one of these barbaric relics that have made their way into the year 20, uh, 2020 here. But uh, mm -hmm. I, I think it's something that needs to fade in, into history, just like uh, you know, chattel slavery is now a thing of the past in, in most places in the world. And we know that that's a good thing. Uh, yeah. I think the same is true of statism. And I see cryptocurrencies as a tool to help speed that up. And, and one slightly, one very related story to that, though, too. I'm, anybody that's listening to the words I'm saying, it's very clear. I'm a very hardcore libertarian but even people that aren't i've watched how cryptocurrencies pull them in that direction so there's a, a guy i knew socially uh, through a sports club i was involved in and uh he certainly not a libertarian at all like the war on drugs is that but he thought oh maybe i'll buy some cryptocurrency and i can make some money with cryptocurrency so i showed him how to buy some bitcoin early on and then the the price of bitcoin went up i don't know 10x or some large amount and then I you know, hadn't heard from him for six months or a year or something like that. And then he contacts me in a panic one day, right? And he goes, Roger, Roger, I need your help. And I'm, what, what is it? What, what can I help you with? What's wrong? And he goes, and again, this guy is, you know, kind of, he's not an American, but like liberal Democrat, like government's great for everything type of mentality there. Um, the government needs to control everything and spend everybody's money. But he comes up to me in a panic and he goes, Roger, I need you to show me how to hide my Bitcoin so I don't have to pay taxes on it. And it really kind of made a big impact on me because I know this guy loves it when government spends money and wants government to do everything. We had suddenly when he has the option to not give his money to the government with the technological means that makes it much, much easier for him to hide his wealth from the government. Now suddenly this guy who wasn't a libertarian in any way, shape or form is effectively acting like a libertarian in the sense that he doesn't want the government to have his money. And I thought that that was a really a strong signal that this can be an incredibly powerful tool for the entire world to put people in charge of their own money so that people that if you want the government to spend your money, go ahead and send it to them. But if you don't, you now have a way to, to, to do what you want with your own money and not, uh, not be in as big a fear uh, than if you were keeping your money in bank of America, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it seems, I mean, we'll take a tangent on this uh, government issue and go back to Bitcoin in a second, but um, it seems like this um, increasing government control is, is a huge trend. I would say actually it's one of the most dominant um, themes in the past, you know, let's say century or two. If you look at, you know, just go back 100, 150 years ago, you know, you, to cross into other countries, you didn't really 
they didn't have an advanced passport system and all this stuff, but it just seems like every decade, you know, it's getting harder and harder to, to travel even without a passport. You know, I know some stateless people and it's just, it's just crazy. Um, the amount of just areas the government has gotten into, uh, to dictate and control. And it seems like with the advent of, in, of technology that's just speeding up, giving more power to those who control power. It just seems that like the government is adopting that, saying, "Yeah, technology, we'll take it here, left here, left right there, and we'll we'll track and surveil and you know uh, achieve our means even better." And it doesn't seem like this trend of increasing increasing government control and power through the you know inclusion of technology. It doesn't seem like it's slowing down. Um, and I don't know, I guess my question is, in 20 years, is the government going to just be like so much more powerful with all this tech, surveillance, all this stuff, AI now? Or do you see the possibility of, A, is there something that's a counterforce, like you're saying, you know, with crypto, people taking, you know, ownership of their own money assets, et cetera, that weakens the government? Is that just a pipe dream we're talking about? Or is this like, in 20 years, can we really see the government with less power? What are your thoughts? Yeah, so you're asking the exact same question that uh, David Friedman was asking in his book 20 years ago, uh, Future Imperfect. And that's that's the question, and we still don't know, right? Are these new technologies going to ultimately be an individual empowering tool, or is it going to be a tool to empower the state to have more control over individuals? And I certainly hope that they wind up empowering individuals to have more control over their own lives rather than the state to have control over them. But we don't know yet. And I, th I think the answer hasn't been decided yet. A lot of it's up to us, the, the business people and investors and entrepreneurs. Like, are we going to invest or, or create technologies that empower individuals? Or are we going to invest in things that empower the state to have control over individuals? And I know I'm going to be taking my time and, and uh, economic resources and, and trying to promote the tools that, that empower individuals. But uh, mm -hmm. the, you know, the, the story is yet to be written, I think, at this point. Yeah. Um, what do you say to kind of the angle where... Um, some people might say that most people don't care about government control as long as their life is, you know, cushy, whatever. They um, are in their, you know, nice house and they have their needs met, that people would just give away, you know, their freedoms um, for that type of life. Um, and that there isn't a lot of people who are willing to stand up for individual rights. Um, I mean, another angle is like, you know, there's something so powerful about, it's almost like this, um, I want to say it's a drug, but the modern kind of comfort, society of comfort and convenience and, you know, one click, whatever, watch this, buy this, order this, you're just kind of um, sedated into this state of, of lull, where a lot of times, you know, people aren't bothered by the loss of individual freedoms. And it seems like those who are champion individual freedoms are just far and few. It's just, and another angle is this, is like a lot of times these people tend to be more international in culture, scope, view, global. They see like a bigger kind of trend happening. Um, yeah, what are your thoughts with all this? Like how, like, did you have something that kind of gave you this, you know, even before, you know, running for state assembly or whatever, like as a libertarian, like did something help you to to see the value of individual freedoms, you know, early on, like when you're growing up or you know, what's the background you think? Yeah, and, uh, I certainly was not born with it. Um, mm. It was from studying these economics books. The more economics I studied, the more of a libertarian I became. And the, the first one that really set me down that path is a uh, I was in junior high school, it was between, I think, between seventh and eighth grade, summertime or something like that. And my mother said, no more video games. And uh, so I had to like find a book to read or something. And, mm -hmm. and uh, on the bookshelf at home, and my, my mother, neither of my parents had ever read uh, this book, but uh, my grandfather had given it to my mother, apparently, uh, at some point. It was a book called Socialism by a man named uh, Ludwig von Mises. And for those that don't know, uh, Ludwig von Mises is basically the founder of the Austrian School of Economic Thought. Uh, and his book, Socialism, when I picked it up, I didn't know what socialism was, um, but I knew Americans were kind of supposed to be against socialism, but I figured I should at least know what it is that we're supposed to be against. So I picked up what I thought at the time was a pro-socialist book. 
And it turned out that uh, I think it was the Wall Street Journal or somebody in the book review, they, they termed it as uh, the book was uh, Ludwig von Mises' Devastating Critique of Socialism. And so I read this book and, and to you know, summarize a pretty thick book uh, in a few sentences here, the, the idea is that prices are incredibly important, right? And so prices are the signals that people all over the world give to everybody else as to what goods should be produced out of what other goods and what they value and what they want. And if you don't have a pricing system and the money transmitting the information as to, you know, what, you know, like, so th this guy, for example, they sold, I don't know, they sold me one box of firecrackers here in St. Kitts, but uh, how do they know? Should they send, you know, a million boxes or, or, or 10 boxes or, or one box to St. Kitts? And it's the amount that they're able to sell for the money that transmits the information as to how many fireworks the, the fireworks factory should, should produce or how many bottles of water the water factory should produce or anything for anyone, anywhere, everywhere. You have to have the pricing system transmitting the information as to what resources should be produced to uh, should be used to produce what consumer goods that people want all over the world. And the moment you have governments blocking the pricing system and the, the information that prices transmit, you, you're not able to perform the economic calculation as to what goods should be produced out of what other goods and how many of them should be produced and where they should be delivered and who should get them and when they should get them and where they should get them. And basically you're just driving in blindfolded at that point. You have no idea what anything should be done with anything else. And so anytime you have government meddling with the economy or the flow of money in any way whatsoever, you're retarding the entire, all of humankind, you're, you're retarding our ability to be able to cooperate with each other to produce the most things that the most people want all over the world. And so it really started to bother me every time I looked at any time government is blocking the flow of money from anyone to anything for anything, they're literally retarding the rate of human progress. They're, they're slowing down the pace of innovation in the entire world. Uh, and so this book explains it very, very clearly that when you, without prices and without money, you don't know what to do. You're just, you're just at a completely at a loss as to, you know, should my, my table be made of gold or plastic or glass or wood? Like you have no idea what anything should be made out of. And that was also part of what attracted me to, to Bitcoin early on is suddenly now there's this tool to allow, like a lot of people just think of money as money, but no, money is a form of speech. It's information. When you go to the store and you buy something with your money, you might not be using words, but the flow of your money tells the store that you value what it is, what it is that they're doing and that you want them to continue doing it and be able, be able to do it. And, 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 and it tells the store without using words that, that you, you want them to continue doing it. And when the store takes the money that you paid them and pays their suppliers, it transmits the information without using words but the information is conveyed to the supplier that they need to continue what they're doing. And it allows people all over the entire planet who never exchange a single word whatsoever to trade or to exchange information. The information flows to people all over the world as to what goods should be used to produce what other goods that people want. And this moment you stop block, you start blocking the money or, or restricting the flow of capital in the world, you're blocking the flow of that information. And if you block the flow of that information, you're making it harder for people to cooperate with each other to produce the things that people want in the world. And so mm -hmm. that book was bringing the turning point for me uh, down this path. And then when Bitcoin came along, it was suddenly here's a way, like everybody loves the internet because you kind of have uncensorable speech for the most part. Anybody can set up a web page and, and start posting their stuff on their blog or whatever. Um, YouTube's a whole other story at this point, but uh, the internet itself, yeah. for the most part, is still a free speech platform. Uh, cryptocurrency became a free speech mechanism for the flow of the information that money provides. And most people, I think, yeah. don't realize that spending your money is a form of speech and it is a transfer of information, even though you're not using words you know, coming out of your mouth or, or through your keyboard. It's still an incredibly, incredibly important yeah. way of, for information to flow around the world. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's why cryptocurrencies are so wonderful. If you support free speech of, with words, you need to support free speech with money as well because it's transferring information that's just as important as the words coming out of my mouth. Mm -hmm. um, okay, let, can you translate this for folks um, like connected to, the, to what the Fed is doing with printing money and all the stimulus? Like what, how does this impair you know, price discovery and the flow of information. Yeah, so most people know that counterfeiting is, is wrong. And the reason they know counterfeiting is wrong is if, if I, you know, go on my color laser printer over here and print up a bunch of dollar bills and then try and spin them around town, uh, there's now more dollar bills in the economy chasing the same amount of goods. If I print up a bunch of $100 bills, 
a whole bunch of new you know, bottles of water or laptops or iPhones didn't come into existence. There's still the same amount of consumer goods out there in the world, but there's now more dollars chasing them. And so that, that's, what, that's what real inflation is, is when they cr print more money, there's now more dollars chasing the same amount of physical goods out there in the world, the price has to go up. Uh, and so that's exactly what happens if, if I counterfeit money in my basement, but when the Federal Reserve does the same thing, and they, they, they call it fancy things like quantitative easing and economic stimulus packages and this and that, but it doesn't produce new things in the world. So I, I haven't been an American for a while, so I haven't followed American politics as cl closely, but there's some build back better thing that I think just, just got scuttled a day or two ago. But let's say they were going to spend a whole bunch of money that they're just printing on a printing press there. And technically they're not even printing on a printing press. There's just a couple of strokes on their keyboard somewhere and they increase their account balances. But then they go and take all that new money and they use it to buy, let's say a whole bunch of iron and asphalt and they build, you know, great big giant new bridges and some hospitals and maybe some skyscrapers somewhere. You can see the bridge. You can see the hospital, you can see the new road, all of that's very clear. And you can say, oh, look what the government built. They built this new bridge where there wasn't a bridge before. This is great. That's what's seen. What's not seen are all the, the man hours that went into building the bridge and the iron ore and the asphalt and whatever other construction materials. All of those man hours and time and resources were diverted away from doing something else. Maybe they would have built a bridge somewhere else where a bridge was needed even more. Maybe they would have built a, a new launch pad for SpaceX to be able to launch an even bigger rocket that's going to go even farther, right? Or, or launch more Starlink satellites. Like you have to look not only at what's seen, but what's not seen. And what's not seen is you're diverting all of these resources from the economy from things that people voluntarily would be willing to pay their money for in exchange and want into something that they wouldn't have necessarily done voluntarily if the money hadn't just print, been printed out of like thin air. And so we're seeing it with, with everything, whether it's from you know houses to cars to jets to boats to anything and everything, the price is just going up like crazy because they've printed so much money uh, in the last year or so. Uh, and it's just causing, it's, it, and, and then not only that, they forced everybody to stay home and they said, don't go to work. So you have fewer people in the factories or in the businesses producing the things that people want and now you have more dollars in the market chasing the, the same amount or maybe even fewer goods than there were before. It's causing the prices of everything to go crazy. And uh, so I was born in 1979. In 1983, so within my lifetime, I'm, I'm not a super old guy. Um, in 1983, one Zimbabwe dollar was worth more than one U.S. dollar, right? And so today, you know, it's, it's what, a couple billion Zimbabwe dollars to one U.S. dollar. But within my lifetime, one Zimbabwe dollar was worth more the one U.S. dollar. And the U.S. dollar today is worth a whole lot less than uh, than it was when I was a kid. I was looking at, uh, at the house uh, I grew up in uh, when my parents finally sold it quite a while ago. They sold it for just over half a million dollars. Today, that same house is just under $2 million. Mm -hmm. And it's a very modest home in, in you know Santa Clara, California. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not because that house is worth so much more. It's a four times better house than it was when my parents sold it. No, it's because the dollar is worth about a fourth of what it was uh, back when my parents initially sold the house. And, mm -hmm. and another really sneaky thing that I think most people don't realize, and you know, thank you to Milton Friedman for pointing this out to me, there's a concept called bracket creep. And so the Elizabeth Warrens of the world and all these other you know, politicians, they love the fact that we have a graduated income tax bracket. And so if you earn, earn you know, $20,000 a year, you pay a, a, you know, a smaller percentage of your income in income taxes than if you earn $50,000 or $100,000 or you know, $200,000 a year. And the more dollars you earn per year, the higher the percentage of your income you have to pay in taxes. Well, guess what happens with government printing all this money and having a little bit of inflation year after year after year? The guy that was earning you know, $20,000 a, a decade ago Maybe now he's earning 50,000 and in another decade, he's earning 100,000. And so even though 100,000 in a decade from now is worth about as much as 20,000 was from a decade ago, he's now not actually, he doesn't have any more buying power each year, but now instead of being in, you know, an 8% tax bracket, he's in a 28% tax bracket. And so he's paying a much bigger percentage of his income in taxes, even though he's not actually earning any more, you know, buying power each year than he was before. So it's a really, really sneaky way through inflation for the American government or any government to bump everybody into higher and higher income tax bracket uh, rates. And so like, it, it makes sense when you hear it, but nobody, you know, they didn't point that out to me in government school either. And so I think people don't realize just how 
bad a deal inflation is for the entire world when government prints money, because not only does it distort the allocation of resources right here and now within the market, but it slowly bumps everybody into higher and higher income tax brackets. And it's basically retarding the entire world's rate of economic growth. And so like your channel is mostly about investing. Well, every investor knows the miracle of compound interest, right? The more years you can compound your interest on your investments, the more money you're going to wind up with. Well, the same is true of economic growth. And so imagine if governments retarding the rate of economic growth, even just by 1% per year, by all of their interventions into the market. Well, the difference in, you know, my, having a 1% raise from this year uh, to next year in my income, not that big of a deal, 1%. But if you compounded that 1% over the last, you know, 150 years, wow, what an amazing, huge difference we would have in all of humankind and all of society today if we'd had just... 1% faster rate of economic growth over the last 100 something years. And so if you think government's retarding the rate of economic growth, even by 1%, you should be appalled by how many more poor people that's created uh, that we have today than there would have been had we not had that uh, retardation of economic growth. And so that that's what turned me into this, you know, mm. wild libertarian person is just like, if you want more economic growth in the world, which helps everybody, you need less government. And you can see it time and time again in the world, uh, North Korea versus South Korea, East Germany versus West Germany, uh, the countries around the world with more economic freedom have a faster rate of economic growth. So uh, let's not just focus on one individual country here or there. Let's focus on having the entire world's rate of economic growth be faster. And the best way to do that is through free markets and free people being able to engage in free trade. And in order to do that, we need a free market money, which are these peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash systems on the blockchain, mm -hmm. which are, are going to improve the lives of everybody uh, year after year. So thank you for letting me rant about that, Dave. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, my pleasure. Um, I'm, I'm curious, do you think growing up in Silicon Valley um, helped you to discover Bitcoin later? Like just the exposure to technology? Um, yeah, what do you think? Yeah, I, I'm, because that was my childhood, my upbringing, it didn't seem strange or abnormal at the time. But yeah. Look, now that I've you know, traveled the world a bit more, I, I realize I was very fortunate to have been uh, brought up in Silicon Valley and just been around technology my entire life and, uh, you know, been using computers my entire life. And I think if I hadn't had that exposure to computers and, and you know, I ran one of the most popular BBSs for people that are old enough to even know what a BBS is nowadays mm -hmm. yeah. uh, in Silicon Valley. Um, if I hadn't had that exposure, I wouldn't have been able to understand the technological underpinnings of Bitcoin and how it works technologically. Yeah. And if I hadn't been able to understand that, I, I, I don't think I would have understood its, its censorship resistance mm -hmm. characteristics there. And then if I thought, oh, people can just shut it down at any time, then, then I wouldn't have been interested in it. So the fact that I, I had been around computers my whole life absolutely did play a, a big role in my appreciation and understanding of Bitcoin early on. Yeah. What BBS were you running and when was this? It was, it was called the Dreamer's Dungeon. Okay. Um, and this was probably, let's see, 94. 94, 93 oh, wow. to, 90, really? to 96 wow, or so, 97, yeah. Wait, wait, so. you were, were you like in junior high or high school back then? Or? Yeah, I started when I was in really? junior high, yeah. Wow, that's fascinating. Yeah, I remember um, BPS, my goodness, um, that was yeah. early on. And for those that don't know, because I'm sure there's young people that are like, <laughs> what is a BPS? They'll have no idea. It was called a bulletin board system, and it was kind oh. of a precursor to the internet. And it was really a fun, wonderful thing, though, because you knew that everybody that was on the BBS and people could call in one at a time or however many phone lines your BBS had. I think at the peak, I had four phone lines running, but uh, you would call in one at a time. So it was like an internet that you would take turns on and only one person could log in at a time or per phone line. But you knew everybody that was logging in were people that were from your local community. And it was everybody that lived kind of in, in your neighborhood. And so it was really a kind of a, a fun experience and way to connect with, with people living in your, your local area. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I actually grew up in San Jose. Um, wow. Yeah, Cupertino area. Um, and yeah, I think I didn't, growing up in Silicon Valley, I didn't at that time understand that um, the unique culture and kind of exposure to technology is kind of granted. It's like, there, you know, so many like, you know, friends of your. Like, I won't say all, but a lot of, you know, parents of your friends are engineers working at these tech companies or whatever. Um, people like a computer isn't a foreign object, you know, it's just, and then this idea of technology and the progression of technology just growing and what it'll do is almost like, I don't know, it's like kind of grant taken for granted in a sense, like everyone just accepts it, that this is a big deal and it's going to progress. And growing up in that type of environment, I think it does, yeah, it, it, it has some maybe deep, profound impact. I'm not sure. I'm still uncovering it myself. But hearing your story, yeah, like 
BBS at like, you know, junior high school age and then um, uh, reading David Friedman. I guess you were in high school at, at that time. Yeah. Yeah. And like understanding that stuff, you're at a very young age, you're understanding the the power of technology, the internet, computers, all this stuff in a, not just a theoretical way, but you're seeing it, you know, firsthand. Um, yeah, pretty crazy, interesting stuff, definitely. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I want to uh, fast forward a bit um, past, you know, we, we've covered a bunch of kind of your precursors to, to Bitcoin. Um, I was listening to one of your interviews where you're saying like, you know, the dark um, net with, kind of the marketplaces or one of the first places that you saw the usage of Bitcoin where you're like, you know, this is the, the currency they're using. Um, how, like, can you explain, like, how did you find out about, you know, Silk Road, you know, and um, what was that process like when you, you know, discovered Bitcoin? Um, and yeah, just take us back to that point. Yeah, so... Um as a, a libertarian, sometimes it can feel a bit lonely in the world. You look around the world and, and there are not that many libertarians and most people just take for granted, oh, the government can control everything. And so to cure some of my loneliness in that respect, uh, I still do, but uh, I, I, was listening, I used to listen to libertarian podcasts. And so it would kind of help me feel a bit less alone in the world because, oh, there are actually other people out there in the world that see things very similarly and that are like myself in that regards. And so one of the podcasts I was listening to was a, a radio show uh, based out of New Hampshire called Free Talk Live. And uh, the radio host of that, uh, the guy named uh, Ian Freeman, um, who's part of this thing called the Free State Project Movement, which was something I was also interested in before Bitcoin, is the idea to try and get you know a, a whole bunch of libertarians to move to the state of New Hampshire that's already the freest of the 50 states in the U.S. and basically just try and have them make it even more free than it is already. And so he mentioned the Bitcoin in reference to the Silk Road, some website where you can buy drugs uh, with it. And this this was you know early 2011 or maybe even late uh, 2010 there. Um, and when I heard about that, I I'm not someone who's ever been interested in drugs, but I I was really I've been interested in e-commerce since the internet began, or even you know on BBSs. Uh, but uh, I thought, wow, like. What the heck kind of money can they possibly be using for this? I, I didn't want to buy or sell the drugs, but I wanted to learn about what the payment method was. And so I logged in and made an account and started poking around and spent a bunch of time on the forums, reading all the stuff there, and just uh, was just you know went down the rabbit hole of uh, this new sort of thing that David Friedman had described in his books. Mm -hmm. This black market uh, e-commerce is starting to to form on the internet, and it was just a really really fascinating time, and it felt like a you know, the start of a, a real life science fiction book was just getting started there. And, uh, and, uh, I, am sorry, I lost track of what the original question was. Yeah, yeah, no, no, that was it. It was just describing kind of how you found Silk Road. And I mean, did the connection, like, you're like, oh my gosh, this is the black market. You can't stop it back. It connects to your prison days where you're like, people are going to, you know, sell stuff. And that you see now this new form of money, this currency that, you know, is just like, perhaps unstoppable. I mean, does that click at all at that point where you're like, wow, this is like the beginning of a new form of money? Yeah, there were there were a couple of things that were all clicking at the same time mm -hmm. there for me. It's like one of which like, oh, here's this uncensorable money for the world that empowers individuals to be able to mm -hmm. do whatever they want with their own money, which will lead to more economic growth, which will lead to a, a better planet for everybody. And then the uh, another piece of the puzzle that was clicking as well is like, is, is if that wasn't already exciting enough for me, right? Because that, mm -hmm. that was something I was super interested in. But wait a minute this new uncensorable money for the world, there's a limited supply of it, right? There's a, there's no central bank that can print more or change the rules of the game uh, midway through. So like if there's a limited supply and the demand is only going to get bigger and bigger as more and more people start to use it, the price of this commodity in terms of, of traditional dollars is going to skyrocket. So uh, there's an economic component there. Wait a minute, I can buy a whole bunch of Bitcoin now, help make it even more useful for people in the world and you know make billions of dollars along the way. Wow, there's another motivating factor. So it's just motivating factor after motivating factor all coming together there uh, that, that, you know, made me not be able to sleep over it. I was so excited about it. So Yeah, yeah. I mean, what's interesting is, um, like, looking back at some of, you know, your advocacy for early Bitcoin back in the day, it's, you know, in a way you were multifaceted in the sense where, you know, you were promoting it as this, you know, 
you know, peer-to-peer ca- new cash system, but also a new economic kind of system of possibilities. But then you connected it to the price action. Like you were very, very confident that this thing would go up a lot. Um, and was it like, did you, was it just super clear to you that a, as demand for this coin or this currency goes up, there's a limited supply. Therefore, there's going to be a direct just, you know, push up with the price. Therefore, if I get in early, but buy a bunch, it's going to go up as long as the demand for the product go, or for the currency goes up. Is that kind of your thinking at the time? Yeah, that, I, there, there was no doubt in my mind on, on that front e- uh, either because I'd had lots of experiences in my life previously of seeing shortages in markets or where there's a big demand for something. So mm-hmm. my, my main business for you know a, a decade before I got involved in Bitcoin was selling uh, computer parts and mainly computer memory. And I saw like oftentimes there'd be shortages of specific parts. And when there's a shortage of the part or there's a big demand because some contract manufacturer needs a bunch of the parts, the price goes up. And whether whether it's, you know, uh, I'm absolutely anything. When there's a big demand for it, the price goes up. I think that I, I saw in the news that there's been a, a shortage of chicken recently. Well, when there's a shortage of something or an increased demand for something, the price goes up. The pricing is transmitting that information. And that's why price controls are so stupid and damaging to, to, to anything. So when you need to allow the prices to adjust to transmit the information. So like an example of that, like mm-hmm. there's all sorts of laws, like after a hurricane, you're not allowed to increase the price like bottled water at the store or something like that because they think, oh, people need to have it. But no, you need the price of bottled water to go up at the stores in the aftermath of a hurricane because that transmits the information. Like if the price is the same as always, people will just hoard them all and the people who really need the water won't be able to buy the water because it all sold out at the normal price. And if the price is allowed to go up, then the people who really need the water will buy it. And when the price is higher, that'll motivate other people from neighboring states or neighboring towns like, hey, the price of water is $10 a bottle over there at where the hurricane just happened. It's $1 in my town. I'm going to load up the back of my pickup truck with a bunch of the $1 bottles of water, drive it over there and sell it for you know $9 a bottle and undercut the people that are selling it for $10. And the other guy say, oh, I'm going to bring another truck load and sell it for $8. And so you'll have this influx of the, of the resources that people need into the area that needs it because the prices were allowed to change. But if the price for the water wasn't allowed to change, you're going to have a shortage of water. There's not going to be any water, and the people who need it won't be able to get it. So it's a really, really damaging thing anytime governments step into any sort of economic situation and don't allow the prices to adjust. So imagine if in the early days of, of Bitcoin, and more and more people are starting to use it, they said, nope, the price of Bitcoin is just going to be $1, and we're not allowed to, to buy or sell it at anything more than $1 effort. Well, there's only 21 million Bitcoins. What happens when more than you know, 21 million people want more than $1 worth of Bitcoin? There's a shortage of Bitcoin. And if there's some law that Bitcoin can never go at more than $1, it's not usable at that point. Like, it, it's a big, big problem. So the fact that the price of Bitcoin... Nobody can control it. There's no central, you know, order book. There's no central place where where people can dictate by law what the price of Bitcoin is going to be. Uh, the price has to go up as long as there's an actual demand for people to want to need uh, Bitcoin to actually, from my point of view, use it in e-commerce to pay for things or use it in commerce to pay for things. That creates the demand. The price has to go up. So there is zero doubt in my mind whatsoever that the price of uh, Bitcoin was going to go up and go up uh, significantly. Uh, today, my view is a, a little bit different there. So like. Uh, for people that don't know, there was this huge civil war that went on within Bitcoin. And the one single version of Bitcoin is split into a couple of different versions of Bitcoin at this point. The thing that is called Bitcoin today bears very little resemblance to the Bitcoin that I got so excited about more than a decade ago. But it still has that Bitcoin name and brand recognition. And people assume, oh, it's you know $50,000. This must be the awesome one. But if you actually try to use it for payments in e-commerce, it's, it's, it's embarrassingly bad at this point. Uh, which is why I like Bitcoin Cash so much more because the user experience is awesome, but it doesn't have the Bitcoin brand recognition or brand awareness, and the price is about a hundredth of the price of of Bitcoin at this point. And so I think it hasn't gotten that much attention. So everybody now says Bitcoin is just a store of value. Well, and that you're not supposed to use it for payments. But if you look at it, what does everybody in the U.S. use as a store of value? They use the U.S. dollar because you can spend the dollar everywhere. In Europe, they use the euro as their store value because they can spend the euro everywhere. And in Japan, they use the yen because you can spend the yen everywhere. Well, this new society that's really forming before our eyes is online on the Internet. I think the store of value for all the people that are on the Internet engaging in buying and selling things is going to wind up being whatever cryptocurrency you can use to pay for everything on the Internet. And so 
Is it going to be Bitcoin? Uh, not unless they get their act together really quick because the user experience is, is embarrassingly bad at this point. Is it going to be Bitcoin Cash? Maybe. Is it going to be Ethereum? Maybe. Is it going to be something else? Maybe. We, we don't know at this point, but I, I do know uh, from all of my previous business experience and study of economics and real life experience, the cryptocurrency that's used as a store of value is going to be the cryptocurrency that you can use as the medium of exchange to pay for everything. And which one is it going to be? I don't know yet, but uh, it's not going to be one that's not usable for payments. It's going to be, you know, one and the same. The one that you can use for payments is going to be the one that's used as a store of value and, and the one that has this, you know, giant market cap. And, uh, you know, who knows? Maybe it'll be Dogecoin. Like if you actually look at it objectively, Dogecoin works far better as money and as a store of value than Bitcoin does at this point. Dogecoin has faster, cheaper, more reliable transactions and has a lower inflation rate than Bitcoin with a similar amount of merchant adoption. Like, there's a compelling case for Dogecoin. But of course, uh, Bitcoin Cash it has even faster, even cheaper, uh, even more reliable transactions with even more uh, with a similar amount of merchant adoption. But it doesn't have the cute uh, dog face uh, coin there. So I don't know. Which one is it going to be? I don't know. But uh, I think uh, a lot of people get confused. And they think, oh, Roger would never promote anything other than Bitcoin Cash. Well, mm -hmm. No, I, I, I promoted Bitcoin early on. And when Bitcoin stopped working as cash, I started promoting Bitcoin cash. And even while I was still promoting Bitcoin, I was providing the seed funding for, you know, Ripple and Zcoin and then the follow on funding for Zcash and a bunch of other coins out there. So I, I'm a fan of absolutely anything that works as peer to peer cash for the world. And uh, and that's what has me so excited to improve the lives of everybody on the planet is the peer to peer cash aspect, not the the store value and just speculate it on, a, on an aspect. And so yeah. uh so that's that's uh, as an investor though you want to invest your funds where the capital is going to flow, not where the capital has already flown. And so uh, I, I I'm not that bullish on the future of of the, the the only thing Bitcoin has going for it, BTC Bitcoin, is it has the brand recognition and brand name, but the user experience is horrible. And so at this point uh, I think you know you and I are probably old enough to remember uh, MySpace, and when the user experience on MySpace became horrible, everybody switched. But even before MySpace, there was another one called Friendster, which was the same sort of social networking thing. But when the user experience on Friendster became horrible, everybody switched. And for those of us that are really old or early to the internet, even before Friendster, we might be able to remember another one that was called High Five, I think it was. And same sort of social network, but as soon as the website became slow, expensive in terms of time to use it because the pages were so slow to load and the pages were unreliable to load, people switched to another one. And I, I think the same can be very, very true of these digital currencies that people are trying to use on the internet for things. When they become slow, expensive, and unreliable, giving users a bad user experience, they'll switch. And we've already seen that happen in large extent between, uh, you know, Ethereum's market cap is more than half of what Bitcoin is. Uh, I think we're not too far away from seeing a Ethereum flip Bitcoin, even though Ethereum's having its own scaling struggles at the moment, but at least they seem to have a roadmap to solve those problems. Whereas Bitcoin, I, I don't see the, the light at the tunnel for them to solve their, their scaling issues. Mm -hmm. um, what do you see? What do you say to people who say maybe digital central bank currencies will perform the role of peer to peer peer to peer cash? So basically, you have this transition from let's say you know where fiat just becomes more and more digital, and that becomes the the pre predominant you know form of of peer to peer you know transactions. Uh, what are your thoughts? Yeah, um, that was my fear in the earliest days of Bitcoin. My, my goal with Bitcoin from the earliest days was to drive as much adoption as fast as we possibly could to as many people and businesses all over the world as fast as we possibly could because central banks and central governments move very slowly. And so if we could get the entire world using cryptocurrency or Bitcoin in this at this point in time uh, to you know pay for everything all the time, it would be too late for governments to catch up and, and, and be able to you know basically jump right out in front of the parade and, and take take charge of it. Um, but that's kind of what we're seeing happening. And some of the most popular digital currencies, period, right now are things like Tether, right, where it's just pegged one-to-one -to, -one to the U.S. dollar. And so we're seeing lots and lots of people using that rather than actual digital currencies. And so in the long run, though, it's so easy to switch back and forth between them. Like yeah. in the long run, I think like hard hard digital currencies are still going to to win out. But in the the short and medium term, like – People are familiar with the dollar. They trust the dollar. Uh, I think we're going to see more and more people using that uh, online in digital commerce, which we already are with with things like Tether and, and Flex yeah. USD and, and USDC and these other ones. Um, but that's not nearly as exciting for for the pace of innovation in the world as, as an actual real uh, digital currency.
Yeah. Um, yeah, the other day I was, like, um, needing to send um, uh, just, like, not that much, like a thousand bucks to to Afghanistan to someone I know there. And um, it was hard because, like, you know, Western Union, you can only send 200 bucks a week or they could pick up, pick it, pick that up. Um, but with crypto, there's actually, like, crypto shops in Kabul and you can actually you know, send crypto and they, and then people can pick up cash in the city. And so, um, the, the interesting thing is like for other forms of crypto, if you do Bitcoin or Ethereum, there's a huge markup because the, of the fluctuations in, you know, um, price, but with, with tether, um, they were doing like 0% markup. So you actually do, you send a thousand dollars of tether, they actually can pick up $1,000 in us cash in Kabul, like within like five minutes. Fantastic. And I was like, I was like Whoa, that, that, that's, that's usefulness right there. You know, it's like, um, you can't do that with, with, with normal, you know, uh, routes, but it just got me thinking. I'm like, and that's one of the issues when you have, a a, a so-called assets where, you know, it's supply and demand driven the price where there's fluctuations um, for you to, to use that type of asset as a peer to peer cash system. There is that, that instability or uncertainty. Will this be 1%, you know, uh, uh, um, lower in price, you know, by the time this transaction closes or by the time our, our deal finalizes, et cetera, um, tomorrow, we don't know, but just the stability of let's say tether where it's like, yeah, this is just going to be, of course, in the bigger picture, you know, if you peg it to something else, like to a digital currency, that tether might be different cost, but still there's a bit more certainty where it's like, yeah, I'll get, you know, this stable that more, more of a constant value, you know, today and tomorrow from that. I mean, does that factor into your thesis at all? Because Bitcoin cash is still a supply driven, you know, investable asset that might not have the, the stability price stability, like a tether. Does that inhibit you know, the potential of, of a, a cryptocurrency to be used as a mainstream form of digital cash? Uh, I think that there's factors in both directions. So like, let's say I go and buy, you know, a million dollars of Tether today. Yeah. My million dollars of Tether is not going to be worth more than a million dollars next year. If I buy a million dollars of Bitcoin Cash or, or Monero or take your pick of any, any mm -hmm. digital currency you want, whether it's Ethereum or Bitcoin, anything, is it going to be worth more in a year from now? Maybe, right? It might be worth less, but the, the dollars we know are going to be worth less year after year. The digital currency, like a actual cryptocurrency, decent chance it's going to wind up being worth more. And so that makes it, uh, I think, more attractive from an investment standpoint. And then in terms of the fluctuation, though, the bigger the market cap becomes of these digital currencies, the lower the fluctuations uh, become. I remember in the early days of, of Bitcoin, it was it was common for it to you know, double or fall in half in, in a single day or even a couple of hours. Now, it still moves a lot compared to traditional markets day, but the, you know, the, when was the last time it fell by a uh, half in a, in a, a single day? Like, I think it's been years since that happened. Um, it used to happen <laughs> every day, basically. So it used to uh, be much. So the bigger the market cap becomes, the more stable it becomes, and the more useful it becomes as a currency. But uh, at the end of the day, people are going to use whatever's the most useful to them, and, and Tether's proven itself to be incredibly useful to people all over the world, and that's why people are are, are using it for all sorts yeah. of things. And uh, you know, I've used plenty of stable coins myself too. They're they're very useful. But my favorite one though is this one called Flex USD, which actually pays between you know five and twenty five percent to APR interest to you, even while you have the coin in your in your actual wallet. So I, I think the stable coins that are paying interest to people uh, directly while they have it are going to become more and more popular because Tether, you know, you don't get any interest, but it's pegged one to one to the US dollar. This other one is yeah. still pegged to the dollar one to one, but you receive interest right there while it's in your wallet and. Uh, I think that's a pretty powerful tool to people all over the world uh, yeah. to, to be able to have a, a basically a savings account pegged to the U.S. dollar, but still earns you know 15% interest on it is is incredible compared to whatever any normal bank is paying. Yeah, um, yeah, because I mean, with with crypto as peer to peer cash, you know, I think in one sense, just the volatility of you know these tradable assets, um, whether it's Bitcoin, Ethereum, whatever. Um, even Bitcoin Cash, it just it adds a, a level of of information uncertainty, like 
going back to this whole idea of you know transmitting information in the economy to make decisions when you're making a transaction and let's say it takes a few hours or something or next day and you're paying so-called in a cryptocurrency that's tradable like asset wise you you've introduced this level of information that isn't there you don't know what what that price is going to be for that few hours or the next day therefore it messes up the whole transaction right and that's where it's possible perhaps you know that kind of price that 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 absence of that price information is preventing you know a lot of currencies from becoming this mainstream peer-to-peer and that's why maybe stable coins have you know played a role in taking off to provide a more of that medium of exchange role um but yeah it's interesting um, any thoughts on that i can comment on, on that actually yeah. though like in any time there's a problem in the world that's an opportunity for entrepreneurs to mm-hmm. solve that problem yeah. and so the problem you were talking about with the price uncertainty of you know what what's my bitcoin cash going to be worth you know tomorrow uh there's already a market uh for exactly that so there's a, a cool website called bit bit.com mm-hmm. that allows you to buy or sell call or put options on the future price of your Bitcoin Cash or, or whatever other cryptocurrency there. And so basically what you're doing, let's say you have $100 of Bitcoin Cash today, but you don't know, but you need to make sure it's worth $100 tomorrow. You can buy an option on there to guarantee that you can sell your Bitcoin Cash for $100 tomorrow. And there's a market where people have their bids and asks right there where you can price the uncertainty of the future price of your, your Bitcoin Cash right there. To solve that exact problem or you can use tether as well as another option yeah. though too and we're seeing people do both but i love the fact that you can buy or sell the uncertainty in the future price of these cryptocurrencies but mm-hmm. unfortunately um i assume you're an american still living in america dave mm-hmm. yeah. uh it's illegal for americans to access this website uh, bit.com mm-hmm. because of i don't know whatever reasons yeah. politicians don't think you can do that but uh yeah. for me i think it's it's wonderful and you can literally see the flow of the information based on the prices. So like if I sell the option mm-hmm. to someone to, to buy my Bitcoin cash in a month from now at $1,000, if the price is really cheap, um, that, that people are willing to pay me for that, um, that means that there's not very high likelihood that it's going to be more than that. But if the price goes up and becomes really high, that means the market is judging that there's a high likelihood that that actually coming true. And so there's just so much information right there in the prices of these uh, futures options for uh for different digital currencies and it's really a, a shame that uh, americans aren't allowed to participate in the markets the the two biggest websites in the world for these sorts of things both have to ban american customers because of i don't know they're scared of the american politicians i guess but uh but uh i'm, I'm sure creative people can figure out a way to still get access mm-hmm. to that information but uh yeah. but it, it's really amazing the amount of information that's transmitted just in the prices of everything even without using words yeah interesting um All right, I want to pass on uh, or pitch a theory and hear your thoughts on this. So um, I think it's it's one possible scenario is that you could divide just everything up into in terms of money, um, assets, the economy. You just put everything into this group of assets and everything that we know as asset as assets, whether it's crypto, whether it's real estate, whether it's stocks, whatever it is, your, your clothes on your back, et cetera. Um, all of those assets over time, it seems like you would become like digitized in some form or tradable, exchangeable. Um, it just seems like um, it's, th- it's kind of this unstoppable move to an economy where all the assets become um, – just liquid, instantly liquid in some way, form or fashion. And of course, there'll be different progressions of 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 how fast different asset types, you know, move toward that. But it seems like you know things are moving toward that. Um, for example, you have like you could buy a small piece of a, a real art, you know, uh, work and trade that or as an asset. Um, but it seems like if that happens over time, then you can skip in a sense the old paradigm of what cash or a money system was because you didn't have that. For example, one of the issues was assets weren't instantly liquidable. Therefore, you needed an interchange. You needed something in the meantime to bridge, you know, and to allow for economic activity and, and transactions. But if all assets, you know, are instantly liquidable digitally, then you just need a simple 
you know, bridge, instant digital bridge to convert an asset to asset um, in a, a split second, and you could basically trade. It's so it's, it's kind of like a, a hyper form of bartering where um, you basically disrupt the idea of what cash is because you can just quickly move the, the asset into value and then exchange it to some, from something else of value. Of course, there could be, you know, there might have to be an agreed, you know, um, uh, it has to peg it to something, but maybe that's irrelevant. Maybe it could be pegged to anything. You know, that's not the key point, you know. Um, so in that type of construct, it, 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 maybe the, 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 the hope for kind of one kind of predominant uh, cash system or, you know, something that everyone uses, maybe that's not even necessary. Maybe it, everything is just assets and we just, you know, trade assets. Like, what are your thoughts with that? Yeah, um, I've been saying for a long time, and I, I think it's still true, um, that everything is money. Everything is competing for the use case of money, right? And it's like even this bottle of water is competing for the use case of money, but this half-drank bottle of water isn't a very good form of money. So people naturally don't use this as money, right? Or, or, the, or the bottle cap from it. People naturally don't use that as money. But, or the table that the computer is sitting on, that can be money, but nobody uses it because it's a really bad form of money. And up until now, the form of money that most people use most of the time is, you know, dollar bills or the dollar in some form or another. And before that, it had been, you know, gold and silver. But all of these things are competing with everything else all the time. But people just naturally use the ones that work the best as, as money. And so in prison, for example, it was, you know, top ramen soups, tobacco, postage stamps. Those naturally were used as money because they worked the best as money. But that doesn't mean that other things aren't also competing to be used as money. They just didn't compete well enough to actually get used. And so in reference to what you're saying with everything starting to be tokenized from pieces of art to this and that, uh, and the fact that you can have instant liquidity from one token to another token on these blockchains and decentralized exchanges, yeah, maybe we're going to see more and more things compete pretty effectively as money mm-hmm. in the world. Whereas previously, you know, this, like I said, this bottle of water mm-hmm. doesn't compete very effectively to be that money. But if we tokenize, you know, this piece of art behind me, maybe that will be able to compete a bit more uh, effectively for the use case of money. And, and we're seeing some of that with this NFT craze. Like I, yeah. I'm not I'm not a big fan of the NFT stuff, but at the end of the day, it's whatever people value is what they value and everybody's their own person can decide for themselves. And there's a huge amount of money uh, flowing around in these NFTs that are being tokenized and people are doing their things with that. So at the end of the day, uh, it's whatever people want to actually use as money. And these blockchains and tokens are giving people more options as to what they can use as money and, and making them more effective as money. If you had a Picasso 20 years ago, there's zero way if you could tokenize it and then trade around the tokens. Whereas now that's uh, very, very possible. And I'm sure people are starting to do things like that. So uh, yeah. long story short, is I, I think I think you're pointed in the right direction with your theory that everything can just start being a, a liquid asset that people could potentially use as, as money or for payments. Mm-hmm. Um, with NFTs, uh, what's your critique? Like, why aren't you, um, like, are you bullish long-term? Do you think this is actually like the start of something long-term of value or do you see it more as a fad that's just going to pop and then maybe, you know, mature in a, in uh, slower over time. Like, I mean, what, what are your kind of ideas with M- NFTs? Um, short answer is I, I don't know. I don't feel the same excitement for them in any way whatsoever that I did with, you know, Bitcoin early on. Mm. Um, but I'm also kind of a, a weirdo outlier, right? So like, I don't know who's the Ariana Grande or something like that. Like I, I can't name a single song that she sings. And like, I had trouble even coming up with some current pop singer's name because I follow that so little, yet there's yeah. millions of people around the world that I'm sure love her and love her music and are buying her you know, songs and CDs or all that. And so like, mm-hmm. I'm not a part of that. That's not my thing. I don't know anything about it. Uh, maybe NFTs are gonna be the same way where everybody's buying their Ariana Grande NFTs and whoever else and they love it and they trade it and there's this you know, multi-billion dollar marketplace for it. And I'm not a part of it. Like that's very possible as well because that's not my thing. But I, I, I don't see or feel or understand the big uh, NFT craze at the moment. But uh, 
but mm -hmm. lots of other people do and and more power to them if they're finding value for them in their own life uh, i'll support their right to to buy and sell ariana grande mm -hmm. nfts or whatever other nfts they're they're up to so uh what is the the goofy one uh board ape yacht club mm -hmm. or something yeah, yeah. Just, <laughs> not, not, not my thing so. got it um yeah you know you know what you yeah, you're looking for it um, for sure. Um, Web3, what are your thoughts on Web3? I mean, uh, Jack Dorsey has been kind of critical of it on Twitter. Elon Musk is not excited about it. Uh, and I mean, there's this debate about the name too, you know, <laughs> what does it mean? But the concept of Web3 um, as an ownership layer on top of, you know, the internet, um, is that exciting to you or how are you looking at, you know, kind of the evolution of, of what people are calling Web3, or some people at least? Yeah, I, I think I haven't heard a, a real clear definition of what exactly Web3 is supposed to be, which yeah. kind of maybe is a good marketing tool because it can be everything to everybody yeah. and everybody. In, sure. And, and that, I think that's part of what made Bitcoin so popular early on, though, is that nobody knew who Satoshi Nakamoto was. So everybody could envision Satoshi being the exact version of Satoshi that they wanted. And there was no real Satoshi to say, no, that's not me. So everybody got the, the exact version they wanted. And so maybe mm -hmm. there's a bit of that going on with Web3. Everybody can, it's not here yet. And so everybody can envision it being exactly the version of the internet that they want it to be. But uh, mm -hmm. for me, the thing that's still exciting is this peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash yeah. payment for the world. And of course, the peer-to-peer -peer cash will be paid via the internet. And so the, the sooner we can have this peer-to-peer -peer cash for the world, uh, the, the better the world will be and the, the happier I'll be and the more excited uh, I think people will be to use it. So Web3, I, I don't know, it, it can kind of, it seems, it feels like it's just trying to be all things to all people and there's not a clear definition of what it is yet. Mm -hmm, sure. Um, one of my followers asked me to ask you, um, who do you think is uh, Satoshi Nakamoto? Uh, short answer is I, I don't know. Okay. Um, there's a couple of theories out there, but uh, I don't know. and, and Whoever, wherever Satoshi is, like if he wanted to make himself known to the world, uh, clearly he could do that. Uh, if he doesn't want to, then more power to him. Like wh whoever whoever that person is um, deserves the uh, thanks and appreciation to, from all of humankind for the, mm -hmm. the invention he released to the world. So uh, thank you, Satoshi, wherever you may be. Mm -hmm. Do you think he's still alive? Maybe. I, 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 I really don't know. So. Got it. Um, I hope he is. I, yeah. I really hope he is, but I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, in one of your interviews I've watched, it, you were talking about how um, the, this concept of separation of money and state. So money and state has always, like, the state has always controlled, I don't want to say always, but you know that's one of the kind of long-standing long habits slash you know, practices of government is to control you know, the money system. Um, do you think it's even possible for government and money to be separated i mean they seem so entwined you know nowadays and especially going forward with the whole kind of you know priority on so-called national security threats against terrorism it just seems the government controlling money would would allow so much power of surveillance and you know so-called protecting the people's security through that surveillance like is this decoupling of of state and money even a realistic goal? Like, what are your thoughts? I, I think people probably thought the exact same way about the separation of church and state a couple of years. They'd say, is that even possible? How could the church mm -hmm. and the state be separated? They're so intertwined and there's, you know, they use it to control everything. And then, and, and, and today we realized that the separation of church and state was a great thing. Um, and I think we're already seeing a separation of money and state start to take place. And I pay for just about everything in, in my life very few dollars get used at this point. It's pretty much all cryptocurrency uh, for just about everything. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I do think it, it, it can happen. And uh, just like a separation of church and state turned out to be great for the world, a separation of money and state is going to be great uh, for the world. And, and the more things we can separate the state from in, in, in the world, period, I think that's a, a good thing for everybody. But uh, we're seeing it happen right before our eyes. Like there's, I, I know lots of people that literally like, don't even have bank accounts. They really don't use anything other than cryptocurrency at, at this point. And, uh, and even at, at Bitcoin.com, as an example, there's a, you know 120 something people working there. All of them are paid 100% of their salary in, in Bitcoin cash. And uh, these are people that you know make it work for them. And I'm sure they convert some of it back into you know whatever the currency is in their own home country. But uh, if, if 
for people that want to, you can you can live all in cryptocurrency right now today. And so that's a really powerful thing that exists that that didn't exist before. So I'm uh-huh. I'm glad to see it's it's already happening. Uh-huh. I mean, do you think the government will will I would say go down, but well, <laughs> the separation of uh, state and money. Do you think the government will will fight, you know, nail and tooth for that control, or do you think it'll just happen to a point where they have no choice? Like, you know, the crypto world, the economy, et cetera, is so powerful, the usage is so there that you know it's just inevitable. It's just like obvious. Like, how do you see this playing out? Like, is there a war? You know, like the government really goes after, tries to save, you know, their, their control of money? Or do you think there's another scenario? Yeah, I, I think that there is. And uh, if I can put my conspiracy theorist hat on for a moment, and I, I don't have hard evidence to this, it's just a, a potential conspiracy theory here. If you were running, you know, the Federal Reserve or the traditional financial system, and you can print as many dollars as you want, and you have control of the entire world and can spy on everybody, it's financial transactions with everything, you wouldn't want this digital currency to come into existence that works as cash for the entire world. And what would be the very best way to stop and delay and hinder the adoption of cryptocurrency for the entire world? Well, it was the exact thing that this Bitcoin civil war was fought over. Uh, a group of people managed to convince and trick the entire world into thinking that Bitcoin wasn't supposed to be peer-to-peer electronic cash. It was just supposed to be a store of value that you don't actually use to transact in and that you should limit the block size uh, to one megabyte. And so we're getting a little bit technical here, but a blockchain is just a a fancy word for a ledger. And so at your Bank of America, uh, they have a ledger that keeps track of how much money is in each Bank of America customer's account. And they can update their ledger to, okay, Roger sent some money to Dave, you know, update the ledger, done. And at any point, the U.S. government can come to Bank of America and say, hey, we don't like the fact that Roger sent some money to Dave, freeze Dave's account, block, block Roger's payment, you know, do all this. With the blockchain, instead of it being on just Bank of America servers, it's on everybody's computer all over the world that's running a, a copy of the, the Bitcoin full node software. But uh, that ledger gets updated to the tune of one megabyte every 10 minutes. And inside that one megabyte of data, you can fit around 2,500 transactions. Well, Bitcoin wound up becoming popular enough to where more than 2,500 people wanted to use it every 10 minutes. And when that happened, there wasn't enough room. So supply and demand, people start bidding for inclusion in the block space. And so at the end of 2017, um, the average bid for a a transaction to be included in that one megabyte of block space got to be over $50 per transaction. And the average waiting time for your transaction to get included in that one megabyte of space every 10 minutes became more than two weeks. So that means the average transaction cost more than $50 in fees and took more than two weeks to go through. And when that happened, we had previously all these major merchants that were accepting Bitcoin companies like Microsoft.com and Expedia.com and all these giant retail websites that were accepting Bitcoin, they all stopped accepting Bitcoin. They stopped using it for payments. They stopped letting their customers pay for it. And we, for the first time in the entire history of Bitcoin, had reverse merchant adoption. And it delayed the adoption of Bitcoin as peer-to-peer money for the world by at least half a decade now and coming on longer and opened the door for all this confusion between should we use Bitcoin, Ethereum, Bitcoin Cash, you know, Monero. There's all this, you know, confusion in the market now. It's bought government at least half an additional decade for them to figure out what they want to do. And so my... My conspiracy theory hat here is that that was government's attempt to literally delay the adoption of Bitcoin being money for the entire world so that government would have more time to figure out what they can do to try and stop, prevent, or delay or hinder this peer-to-peer electronic cash for the world. And so, again, there's not super hard evidence of that, but there's a lot of interesting evidence that uh, would show that it was nation states that really were the, the big impetus to restrict Bitcoin's block size to one megabyte and prevent it from being usable uh, as cash for the world to the point where literally like, you know, Microsoft and Expedia used to accept Bitcoin and then stopped because of this block size limit. So uh, Mm. how would governments stop or what are they going to do about it? Maybe they've already actively been undermining Mm. it the entire time uh, to the point where they demonize and now mock anybody that thought that Bitcoin was supposed to be usable as money for the world. Uh, And so maybe maybe they've already delayed it by, uh, by quite a bit. Wow, that's crazy. That's an interesting uh, theory. And um, what if they have uh, agents from the government on Reddit? <laughs> well, so I, I think it's so funny you should mention that too. So, like uh, uh, in in 2011, yeah. 
uh, Bitcoin went from like two dollars to thirty dollars uh, yeah. in the course of I don't know ten days or two weeks or something like very very quickly, right? It went mm -hmm. up you know more than ten x uh, there, and the entire it was getting a you know news cycle from around the world. Everybody was talking about Bitcoin, and mm -hmm. at that point the main discussion platform for everybody in the entire world was this website uh, called BitcoinTalk.org, mm -hmm. and uh, suddenly when everybody in the world was you know when Bitcoin was on the front page all these newspapers and then you know the, the tip of everybody's tongue. The website where everybody was talking about it intentionally by somebody disrupting it became unusable. And the way they made it unusable is there were all these fake bot accounts that would just post in every discussion thread, buy, sell, oh no, and just, just frivolous fluff posts that didn't actually say anything of substance whatsoever that made the forum unusable because the forum was just flooded with posts that just made it look like a bunch of fluff. And so that was very clearly an attack on the ability for people to discuss Bitcoin online. And it was timed when there was a media cycle about Bitcoin that made it to where everybody would go and be looking into it at that point. And so like from as early as 2011, mm -hmm. someone out there was going through a lot of time and effort to disrupt people's ability to, to talk about Bitcoin. And we know even from as early as 2010, the CIA was already interested in, in, in Bitcoin and they invited some of the, the people that were involved in Bitcoin to explain it to them because they wanted to know how it works. So don't right. think that the government you know, just started paying attention to Bitcoin recently. I and mean, the CIA literally was asking for meetings with people that knew about Bitcoin in uh, 2010. So this isn't something uh, uh -huh. that just you know came uh, onto the radar recently of government. Yeah. yeah. And for those who don't know, um, I believe, you know, Roger, you're, you've uh, insinuated that or I want to say, you've been very clear that the Bitcoin Reddit, the main Bitcoin Reddit community, uh, community you think is censored, um, had a big I don't role. Don't think it is. Yeah. It is, and they openly say it is. <laughs> yeah. And had a big role in the whole Bitcoin Civil War, war to 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 push it to store value, not peer to peer cash. What if, um, let's say, let's rewrite, you know, history hypothetically. Let's say um, Bitcoin actually chose you know back in 2017 or so to to increase block size to go for cash role not store value and let's say hypothetically you know transactions slash the the use cases of bitcoin as you know um uh a, a purchasing you know reality just took off like crazy let's say it's just everywhere you know you could buy stuff with with this bitcoin um form of cash like do you think like that would have created such momentum and such just um usage where the government maybe couldn't catch up where it just like you know it just becomes the pervasive culture and now the government has almost already lost their control i mean i would say at that time but it becomes inevitable that there's this separation of church and state, but by buying time, I don't know how it happened, but because there isn't a predominant form of, let's say, you know, cryptocurrency cash where everyone's using it, now it's an uncertain kind of um, future where we don't know what's going to happen, you know, in terms of money and state. Yeah, per perfect summary, Dave. Uh, that, mm -hmm. the, the goal and the strategy was to get. And we had the momentum. I mean, literally, mm -hmm. Microsoft was starting to use Bitcoin. Expedia was allowing you to book everything with Bitcoin. And we had these major, major websites integrating Bitcoin. And it was just like one amazing news story after another, day after day of adoption of Bitcoin happening. And all of that not only halted, it literally reversed when that block size limit was, was hit, uh, which was un just unimaginable that that would be a, the, the pivot that Bitcoin would be shoved down uh, from the people that were involved in Bitcoin in, in, in the early days. So uh, the goal and the strategy was to do exactly what you said, just get so much merchant track uh, adoption and traction that people were using it for everything all over the world, that it would be it would be too late for governments to react and it would become the default uh, money for the world. But mm -hmm. instead, by whatever whatever means, whatever the reasoning was it uh, for it, uh, governments now have had you know extra at least half decade and, and likely it'll wind up being a lot more to figure out what they're going to do to try and delay and hinder and control and restrict the adoption of of uh, cryptocurrencies around the world mm -hmm. so uh for me uh, that's that's very disappointing because life life is short you know i, I can yeah. hardly believe it. i'm 42 years old mm -hmm. just blinked my eyes and you know half of my uh average human expected lifespan at the moment is already gone uh i hope 
I, I want to I want things to progress as quickly as possible in yeah. in the right direction, not not slowly. So, yeah. uh, I mean, is that kind of why you are so passionate about Bitcoin Cash and promoting it? It's because you you see this window of opportunity where you know we need to get crypto into the the role of cash fast. You know, before let's say, you know, like the window closes. Yeah, I, I um, that's certainly why I was so passionate early on because the window was wide open and we had an amazing chance. And I was trying to shove peer-to-peer cash through that window to the world as fast as I possibly could. At this point, I, I don't know, but I, I the window is certainly closed more than it was before. Maybe, maybe it's closed uh, most of the way or, or even all the way there. We, we don't know exactly how things are going to play out because now – you know, cryptocurrencies certainly have everybody uh, in government's attention, you know, front and center at this point. And uh, we had an amazing opportunity where I think we could have, uh, I don't know, where it would have been too late. The cat would have been out of the bag, so to yeah. speak, in regards to cryptocurrency, whereas maybe the maybe the cat's not out of the bag yet. Mm-hmm. Got it. Um, I want to um, kind of wrap up on a just a side kind of personal note. I noticed you've um, been... Um, uh, I guess more of a global citizen now in some ways where you've lived in other countries like Japan, you've been in the Caribbean a lot, um, a proponent of, of, you know, various citizenships as well. Um, yeah. How do you determine like where you spend your time geographically? Are there favorite spots of the world that you enjoy? Um, and yeah, I'm just curious, as as a person who's become more, let's say, international in experience over the past decade or or more, like, yeah, you know, what's your what's your take on, on kind of, is I, another question is like, how important is it for you to kind of, you know, just have a broader view and experience of the world and just previously, let's say, you grew up in the states, you know, just having that more, um, I guess you know, more narrow, you know, a background experience. Yeah. Um, th- there's another YouTube channel. Their slogan is just go where you're treated best. Mm-hmm. And I, I think that's a, a good slogan to live by. And so I'm, I'm, you know, talking to you from St. Kitts right now. Mm-hmm. St. Kitts definitely has a, a big piece of my heart here. It's a be- beautiful Island country in the uh, Caribbean. You can buy citizenship here effectively uh, for about 150,000 us. You can pay for the entire thing in in cryptocurrency uh, at this point. Uh, it's just a beautiful, beautiful island with, uh, at the moment, pretty good COVID restrictions. Like there's not a whole lot of craziness about that. It's not quite as good as Miami on that front, but mm-hmm. it's not too far off either. Uh, but previously, they had locked down the entire country where nobody was really allowed in or out. Uh, it was yeah. a big problem. So so uh, so I I left and then hadn't been here for a while, but. Uh, yeah, it's a big giant world. Don't don't restrict yourself to where you happen to have been born, right? And what are the odds that you were born in the very best place in the entire world, and that it'll continue to be the very best place in the entire world for your entire life? Uh, the odds of that are very low. So, you know, go out there and, and see the world and explore things and uh, see what you like. Maybe you'll find something new that you you like more than what you've uh, been up to in the past. Yeah. What do you think? Um, what country do you think is the the freest country in the world? As I mean, as a libertarian, you know, voluntarist, like, what is there any country that you think, you know, you jive with, you resonate, or do you think, do you think you just need to be part of a new country? I mean, is that even possible? Do you think about that at all? Yeah, um, I, as the the word I like to describe my philosophy the most is a voluntarist, and that's someone who thinks that all human interaction should be on a voluntary basis yeah. or not at all. And so if everybody's dealing with everybody on a voluntary basis, well, that's the exact opposite of what the state is. The state is the monopoly on coercion, on violence. And so uh, I guess my in my ideal world, uh, we wouldn't have a state. Um, so which country in the world is the best right now? I don't know. I'm saying Kitts is pretty good at the moment. But, uh, you know, there's there's other things that aren't, aren't so great, uh, you know, anywhere. So uh, I spent some time in Dubai recently, like from an economic standpoint, it was – you know, really free and open, but then uh, better watch what you say politically over there as well. So uh, I don't know. I may, maybe uh, maybe Mars will turn out to be a pretty good place too. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll see. So. Yeah, I hear you. All right, uh, Roger. Thanks for um, being generous with your time, uh, your thoughts, your sharing. Definitely appreciate um, all your stories. I mean, you've had just a a, a critical role, I think, in the history of crypto 
past decade. And um, yeah, it's fascinating. I know you have a, a YouTube channel. I'll go ahead and link that in the video description. I'll, I'll also link your Twitter account. Are there any other kind of places that you might uh, direct people to to learn about what you're doing? Yeah, and if you want to contact me about something, you can just email me at roger at rogerveer.com. And uh, I'm happy to reply and, and be helpful however I can. Okay, awesome. All right, thank you, Roger. It's um, been awesome talking and chatting, getting to know you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Dave.